And the other thing that I, I can also do, so I'm going to be giving a talk in English, but uh, if you have any questions, you you know you you can ask me in Russian. So I, obviously, I speak Russian as well. So um, okay, sounds good. So let me just share the screen, and uh, I'll go from there. Uh, let's see if it works. It was working before. Um, is it? Let's see. Is it working? Uh, could you please just uh, switch the full screen mode? Uh huh. The, the is this working now? Uh, not really. Can you see it now? Yeah, it's cool. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. So let me uh, oops, let me just come back to this. Okay. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to tell you a little bit about deep learning and representation learning for reading comprehension, which is um, a very interesting topic that a lot of us in, in the community are working on. <clears throat> Let me first start by saying that, you know, we live in the age of large-scale data, right? If you look at the space of images, text, relational data, and building models that can process all that data in a meaningful way is, 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 is a challenge, right? And deep learning is, is one way of, of doing that. Um, there's been a lot of impact, a lot of success stories in deep learning. So if you look at speech recognition, computer vision, um, you, if you look at recommended systems, language understanding is something that I'm going to talk about, you know, in this uh, uh, in today's talk, and also in places like health, drug discovery, and medical image analysis. So there's more interesting work happening in that space as well. So some of the key challenges, just for many of you who are interested in, in, in that field, um, there is a lot of work right now in the last few years on building models that can reason, that can have memory and, and can have attention. And we'll talk about those models today. Also, natural language understanding is, is, is another very big area of, of research. There are also a couple of other areas. Uh, one is deep reinforcement learning. So I'm not going to talk about reinforcement learning in today's lecture, but it's a fascinating field. And also in the areas of unsupervised learning, transfer learning, and one-shot learning, right? So unsupervised learning is can we take, can we make use of unlabeled data, large volumes of unlabeled data. Transfer learning is the setting where you're building model for one domain, can you use it in another domain, and, and one-shot learning. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about a couple of um, <clears throat> ideas for reading comprehension talk. So this is building systems that can understand something about text and answer questions about the text. So I'm going to talk about multiplicative and fine grain attention. Uh, it's going to be probably the main part of the talk. Uh, I'm going to also show you how can we incorporate knowledge as explicit memory for recurrent neural networks. And I'll say a few words about retrieval and comprehension, right? Because I think that you guys are at the uh, uh, retrieval workshop, so it's a little bit more relevant for retrieval and comprehension. So, what is the reading comprehension about? <clears throat> Let's see, I give you this particular document, uh, right? And it says, arrested Illinois Governor Rob Blagojevich and his chief of staff, John Harris, on corruption charges, included Blagojevich allegedly conspiring to sell and trade the Senate seat left vacant by President like Barack Obama. So, uh, you might remember back in 2008, in the U.S., there was a big scandal where Rob Blagojevich, a senator, uh, was trying to kind of sell... Uh, Obama's seat, because Obama was a senator as well, and he was trying to like get some bribes and such. And let's say I have this document and uh, or news, and I have a query. President like Barack Obama said on Tuesday he was not aware of alleged corruption by X, who was arrested and so forth, right? So the question is, can you build a model that can answer what is X, uh, right? And you can see that this is not a simple task of just doing simple matching. Because in order to answer this query, you actually have to look at at least two sentences to figure out what the right answer is. And obviously, the answer here is Ron Blagojevich, right? But again, the answer here could be John Harris, that's a name, it could be Barack Obama, right? So you have to build a model that has some understanding of, of, of uh, what the answer should be. And that's actually pretty challenging because it goes beyond just simple pattern recognition. And here you're trying to figure out how to combine multiple different sentences from the entire paragraph or entire document to come up with a question, okay? So how are we going to set up the task? We're going to set up the task as a supervised learning problem. So given a document query pair, so I give you a document, I give you a query, these in natural language, uh, you're going to find an answer in A which answers question Q, 
uh, right? So given a document, if we're given a query, and uh, uh, we want to produce the answer, right? Uh, an answer right now is going to be coming from fixed vocabulary. So, uh, so there's a specific, you know, typically you have maybe on the order of 10,000 possible answers, and you're trying to find one. Okay, so it's a little bit constrained. Uh, there is this, there is there is another sort of area which instead of finding one specific answer, it's actually finding the span of tokens in the document, which is sometimes called extracted question answering. So you're pointing out to the document and you're pointing out, you know, uh, a span of uh, words that answer the question. Um, and so question answering, information extraction, you can sort of think of. Uh, um, test for, for text representation models, right? So obviously better representation for your language, for your for your documents can help more questions, so can can help you answer questions more accurately. So so what we're gonna do is we're gonna right now look at supervised learning approach. Right? So we're given these triplets as the training data, right? Document, question, and the answer. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to build a probabilistic model. We're going to build the probability of the question, of answering the question, given the document and, and the question. So C here is now going to be our predictor for what the right answer is. It's coming in from a fixed vocabulary. Uh, we're going to be optimizing loss. This is standard loss functions. This is called um, uh, log loss. Uh, so we're trying to maximize the probability of the correct answer under the model. And we're going to be training is just going to be simple, you know, optimization where we're trying to minimize our loss with respect to the parameters of our model, right? So if you look at the entire approach, this is a fairly standard supervised learning approach, right? But what we're going to do in this talk, we're going to focus on the model, right? And we're going to try to look at the what architectural biases we can build into our model so that we can predict accurate models here, right? So the data set, the loss function, the training, obviously there's a lot of research on how do we do optimization and so forth. We're not gonna talk about it in today's lecture, we're just gonna talk about the model itself. What kind of models we're gonna be building, okay? So how do we design the, the neural network to reflect the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve, okay? So if you look at traditional models like convolutional neural networks, Convolutional neural networks are specifically designed to process images, right? So some 2D spatial data. Recurrent neural networks have architectural biases towards sequences. So anytime you have a sequential data, recurrent networks have been shown to be quite successful in processing uh, sequential data. Um, and then for these reading comprehension tasks, we might also ask how can we build something that reflects linguistic phenomena, right? Something about the language. Because language is, is, is unique uh, in some ways. And there are three things that we need to worry about. One thing is alignment, the second one is paraphrasing, and the third one is aggregation. So I'm going to make precise what these things are that we want to capture. And this is going to be part one. And then we're going to try to introduce some uh, prior knowledge, like co-references, semantic dependencies, word meanings, into the second part. Okay, so let's so focus on the first part. So what are the text phenomena that we're thinking about? If I give you this particular document and the query, uh, right, one thing I might want to do is I might want to do something that's called alignment. And again, this is something that's being used a lot in the text retrieval community, right, in information extraction communities. So for example, I might say President-elect Barack Obama appears in the query and then over here in this sentence, you have President like Barack Obama. So I'm trying to basically say, is there some correspondence between what I see in the query versus where I observe these particular words in, in, the, in the document, right? And the idea here is that maybe, you know, sentences where there's overlap between the words, maybe those sentences are more relevant, right? So there's an alignment problem. And then there is a more important problem, which is paraphrasing, right? So for example, conspiring to sell versus trying to sell, those two things mean the same thing, right? Even though conspiring and trying might not really have be the same words, right? So corruption charges versus corruption might be, uh, oh, sorry, versus alleged corruption versus corruption charges, that's also uh, uh, paraphrasing, or Obama's Senate seat versus Senate seat left vacant by President-elect Barack Obama, 
Right. So you, 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 you can imagine that, you know, whenever you're asking the question, you obviously need to deal with paraphrase. And that's important. And this is where traditional information retrieval uh, 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 methods will fail. Right? Because if there is no, you can't find the right words, but these are paraphrases, you need to take that into account. So that's actually one big area of research where people are, and we'll so, show, I'll show you some examples where paraphrasing is actually is important. And then the last part is aggregation. Right? So once you find out the relevant information, how do you actually aggregate this information across multiple sentences? Um, right, so... And, and again, this is something that we'll not pay attention to that much, but it's mostly will be once we find out the right sentences, the right representations, then we're going to do something simple as aggregation, as just summation. And, and we'll see that. Okay, so how do we deal with paraphrasing? Uh, one way to deal with paraphrasing is to use something that's called word vector representation. So this is a way of mapping words into vectors, into semantic vectors. Right? Plus, we're going to be using recurrent neural networks to sort of aggregate information, and aggregate context around every single word. And this is the key thing for us to represent uh, the document and the query. Right? Um, alignment is an important part, and we're going to be using something that's called multiplicative attention. So we're going to be using attention mechanism, but in a very specific way. Um, and for aggregation, we're going to be doing multiple passes over the document. So this is where the multi-layer systems come into place. We're going to be building multiple layers of representation. And then something is called point to some attention. That essentially aggregates uh, uh, multiple word tokens across, across different uh, sentences. And as I go through the talk, we'll look at every single one of them in more detail. So how do we represent documents and queries? Um, we can think of it as a composition of word vectors. So let's say we have arrested Illinois Governor Rob Um We're going to be representing every single word in its vector-based representation. And there are multiple ways of doing it. Um, there is something that's called word to vector representation. There's something that's called glove representation. You can pre-train these models on large, unlabeled corpora. But the idea is that we're going to be mapping every single word into its vector-based representation. Uh, and these vector representations, you can think of them as semantic representations of the words. Right? So they carry some paraphrasing in them. Okay? So some of the things that can help when we're building these models is um, uh, we found that using pre-trained glove embeddings uh, work better than work to vec embeddings. Uh, glove embedding is a sort of slightly different ways of, 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 of finding these, these vectors. Sometimes we have to deal with something that's called out of vocabulary tokens, right? At test time. So at test time, sometimes we might see words that you've never, we've never seen before at the training time. And so in many cases, you want to use random vectors for, uh, for assigning tokens, uh, out of vocabulary tokens. Sometimes you can also use character-based embeddings to, to characterize morphology of the sentences, right? And there is, if you're interested, there's some work on, on that uh, in that space in my lab, um, where we're basically trying to figure out what's the best way, how can, what's the best way of, of, of doing embeddings, um, meaningful embeddings of words. And I'll come back to character-based embeddings uh, later in the talk. Okay. Now we're going to be using something that's called bidirectional gated recurrent units to process words or tokens from left to right and right to left. And these are um, uh, sort of called GRUs. These are instances of something that's called LSTM, uh, recurrent neural network models, long-term, short-term memory networks. Again, these are nonlinear systems that essentially allow you to aggregate information across sentences. Um, and the way to think about this, right, is whenever I do this pass forward, right, this node, for example, is aggregating information that's coming from, you know, the, the, the left part, which is arrested Illinois governor. So this representation will have something about arrested Illinois governor. This representation here, backward, will basically try to capture something about governor Rob Lagoyevich. So when we combine both of these representations, and that's the nature of bidirectional uh, model, we get some representation here that's essentially combining the word governor and the context around it. So this 
take information about arrested Illinois Governor Rob Blagojevich. Right? Same thing happens for these tokens and for these tokens. Right? So they kind of integrate in some local context around every single word. And again, this is where paraphrasing is happening. Because if instead of governor, I would say senator, this representation would be pretty much the same. Right? And that's the beauty of it. Uh, or if I replace Illinois with something else, potentially, right, this representation wouldn't change by much. Um, and so now we're going to be creating what we call document tokens. These are for every single word. Is the concatenation of the forward RNN and the backward RNN. So that's going to be our representation. So now we have a representation of the document, which is of size twice the number of hidden units that you're using in your current networks by the length of the document. Same thing for the query. Right? So now you have this long document and you have this question that you're trying to uh, answer and that's the representation that you have. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use something that's called attention, which uh, uh, has played a really huge role in machine translation and question answering pretty much in all different domains. And the way we're going to do it is the following, right? We're going to take the representation for every single word or for every single token in the document, let's say it's a blood voyage here, and this is the representation of the query, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the element-wise multiplication of this representation with every single representation in the query. We're going to pass it through the softmax function, which essentially uh, allows us to get the probability distribution over these tokens. So what you can think of what these alphas are, these alphas will be numbers that sum up to one, but what effectively they're doing is they're basically saying, find me in the query for this particular word, what words here are relevant for this particular word, right? So for example, Blagojevich will highly be, kind of have high probability of being associated with corruption by, but maybe not with the word was or who was, right, and such. So that's where you have the attention mechanism, right? You attending to the relevant parts of the query. And um, in this case, what we're going to do next is we're going to use element-wise multiplication between the document tokens and our overall representation of the query. So this is token, this is kind of a, 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 a document-specific representation of the query. So we're kind of matching, doing this soft matching between the query and the document. Um, and then, once we get the representation, essentially this is now representation for that particular word. It's basically telling us how important this word for this particular query. Now, the reason why we go through these operations, like a softmax operation and the summation operation, is because um, when we get this particular representation, we can construct this whole thing. This whole thing becomes differentiable. Right? It basically becomes a continuous function, and which is important because what that means is that when we learn the parameters of these models, we can essentially use gradient-based optimization can backprop uh, through the entire model. So the entire system, you can think of it as a fully differentiable system, right? which is important. Uh, that's why these attention mechanisms are sometimes called soft attention. Uh, where we're defining probability distributions and we can then pass the gradients through the entire model. Right? So essentially what we're doing is we're finding features in the query which match the contextual representation of the document and we also gain the document representation by multiplying with these features. So what this operation does is it's a soft operation that basically figures out what tokens in the document, what words in the documents are important for the query. And that's kind of the aggregation information that, that's being passed to the next layer. Right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to perform several passes over the document. Right? We're doing this particular gated attention. We're finding some representation. And then that representation goes to the next layer. And we repeat this operation again. So what's happening with the model is that as you go through multiple layers, you're essentially filtering irrelevant information and you're only maintaining the correct information or information that's relevant to your query, right, and so forth. And you repeat it for multiple layers. Now, if I look at the overall diagram, this is where things become a little bit interesting. If you've seen, for example, um, deep learning models like convolutional neural networks, right, you sort of have, you know, an input layer, and an image, you do some convolutions, you do some operations, and so forth. 
what's happening with these reading comprehension models is that every single layer here is a much more complex layer, right? Because it basically um, uh, uses a recurrent network, so it, so it finds what is the right representation you're seeing in a document related to the query. So you do processing here, you pass it to the next layer, and so forth. So at the high level, you can think of these models where every single layer is a much more complex layer that basically takes time into account, that process filters information uh, uh, through time. Um, and then once you get to high level representation, then what you can do to answer the question, you basically take an inner product between the query embedding and the output of the last layer. And the probability of a particular candidate is then aggregated over all document tokens that appear in your, uh, um, uh, in, in sort of uh, your word tokens. So for example, this uh, is something called point of sign attention model, was developed in 2016. The way to think about this particular aggregation mechanism is it's basically saying that if you keep seeing Obama a lot in the document, then this model, the bias in this model is basically to say that maybe the answer should be Obama, right? Or if you see, I don't know, some other name in the document a lot, maybe that name should be the answer. Right? So it sort of has this bias, and obviously it depends on what these representations are. Like for example, Rob Blagojevich, if Rob Blagojevich appears a lot, then maybe that should be the answer. But at the same time, if Rob Blagojevich doesn't survive, if the model believes that this representation is useless for the, for, to answer the question, then this S sub i would be close to zero, right? because it would be relevant to the question. Um, and then again, this entire model, that's the probability of the answer, you can backpropagate through the entire system and that's where the power of these models come in place because in many cases you can actually fine tune and train the whole model in an end-to-end -end fashion, whose objective is to just predict correctly uh, the, um, the, the questions, right? And once you do that, the candidate with the maximum probability is selected as the predicted answer. So at the test time, you're just looking at the most probable answer and that's the answer that you report. And then you're using cross-entropy loss between the predicted probability and the true answers as your training objective. Um, this is standard for supervised learning. So let me show you some results. Like <coughs> there are a whole bunch of different data sets. There are um, CNN data sets where you take snippets of CNN news and you're ask, asking questions about it. Uh, there's who did what data set, is the Daily Mail data set and such, right? So if you're just using it, the word embedding, so if you're using simple RNNs, you sort of get uh, okay, performances, but once you have these gating mechanisms, uh, then you're essentially getting pretty much state-of-the-art across a whole bunch of different data sets. And it's actually pretty interesting because these are not that trivial questions, right? And you're sort of getting close to the 80% of being able to answer the questions, which I think is pretty, uh, uh, pretty remarkable. You know, five years ago, this would not be possible uh, because you've seen some of those questions, right? These are not simple type of questions. You actually have to parse the entire document and be able to find some correspondences between different sentences in order to be able to answer those questions. Obviously, human level performance here is in, in the high 90s, so there's still some room for improvement. I uh, just wanted to show you that in the last three or four years, this is just the span of all possible uh, algorithms that people are experimenting, right? So you can see there is a lot of work on people are trying to design the right architectural biases, the right attention mechanisms, in order to be able to push the performance of, 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 um, of these models. One other thing you can do with these models, which is pretty cool, is to look at the analysis of attention, right? You can say, well, if I'm answering for that particular question, what are the key features that the model is finding, right? And what you can do is you can basically look at the softmax here, and you can look at these alphas, because these alphas are telling you what's relevant in the query and the document, and what's not. So here's an example of uh, what the system is discovering for this particular um, um, case. What the, the system is discovering at the layer one is that alleged corruption is very closely related to Rob Blagojevich. So it somehow is learning that to be able to answer this question, alleged corruption is an important feature. So this is not something that you're giving to the model a priori. This is something that the model is discovering on its own. Um, if you look at the second layer, 
it basically picks up Senate seat and associates it with Rob Blagojevich. So it's basically kind of picking up on these features automatically, like corruption charges and Senate seat. And once it picks up on these kind of representations, then it can answer the question correctly. This is Rob Blagojevich. So in many cases, the beauty of, of these attention-based mechanisms is that you can look and try to figure out, at least as in terms of being able to explain why the model is making a mistake or why it's making a correct prediction, and what are the key features that the model is discovering. Right? So, so the summary so far is that um, uh, you have multiplicative attention for documents, and multiple layers allow you to focus on different salient aspects of the query. Right? So as you go through multiple layers, you're picking up the most important information uh, 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 from the document itself. Um, and as I mentioned before, these are state-of-the-art models compared to traditional approaches. Right? In traditional approaches, if you're just doing some kind of key value matching, trying to find word matching between the query and, and, and the document, which is what a lot of uh, standard information retrieval approaches would do, uh, this is, you can think of it as like a soft differentiable way of soft matching and paraphrasing and finding the right, uh, the right answer. If you're interested in these kinds of models, there is a code, there is a data, and you can just basically uh, use it for uh, your own purposes. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say a few words about is words versus characters. Um, what we found is that word-level representations are good at learning semantics of the tokens, right? Uh, but character-level representations are more suitable for modeling sub-word morphologies. So there's been some work in terms of trying to figure out, should we use character-level representations? So for example, the word-level representation, the word cat and cats, would, is, would be assigned two different vectors, uh, right? Uh, whereas if you look character-level representation, the word cat and cats would basically have a very similar representation. Right, because they only differ in one character. In particular, in Russian language, I think that the character level representation would be extremely useful because there are so many derivatives of a particular word that you can come up with. Um, so word level representations can, you know, you're basically getting them from a lookup table. Um, whereas character level representations are usually obtained by applying RNN or convolutional neural networks, right? In exactly the same way. So you can apply an RNN model where the input at, at a single time step is a character, right? So these are simple models, much like you're processing words. You can now process characters as well. Um, and here's one example of what you can do. You can basically say my representation of a hidden state is going to be the weighted average between a character level representation and a word level representation. So this is kind of like an embedding of the words into, into the semantic space. And g here is the gating function. Think of it as a sigmoid function, right? That's a number between 0 and 1. And the sigmoid function itself can have additional features. For example, you can have name entity tags, part of speech tags, frequency counts, and so forth, right? So this is the kind of model that basically says, should I trust my embedding, or should I trust my character level embedding? Or maybe there is some combination of both. And as you're training your model, again, you can backpropagate through the parameters of this model to figure out for your corpus when should you trust your character level, when should you trust your word level representation. So character level representation are very useful for misspellings, for example, or for some derivative of the word. So what we found uh, uh, you know, for, for a bunch of different data sets, actually this, this gating of combining characters and words can lead to improvement. Uh, but more importantly, here's what we found. Um, uh, you know, so what I'm showing you here is that for these words, the model is choosing to use word-level representations. And the reason why is because these are very frequent words, like the word among or the word however, appear so much in the text that I can just find the right representation, you know, uh, vector-based representation for that word. Whereas these are the words that the model is choosing to use character level representation, right? And it's interesting, like in many cases, it picks like these things, German swill. And German swill is, um, is uh, whenever you have like will here, W-I-L-L-E, this is an indication of, uh, of a town, the name of the town, 
Like, um, and so it actually picks up on these kinds of things, a submorphological structure, and it can tell you something about that is actually the name of the town or the name of the city and such. Uh, right? So things that are rare that you don't have enough information to learn from, from just the words themselves, you're using character-based embeddings, which, kind of, which is kind of nuts. Now, let me spend a, a little bit of time uh, showing you how can we incorporate some knowledge, as explicit memory, in, in these models. So let me give you an example. This is actually a pretty hard uh, example to deal with. So this is called broad context language model. So uh, this is a particular data set called Lambada data set that was constructed uh, a year ago. And, and let me show you what it does. Suppose I give you this sequence of sentences. Her plain face broke into a huge smile when she saw Terry. Terry, she called out. She rushed to him and then they embraced. Han, I want you to meet an old friend, Owen. Owen, please meet Emily. She gave me a quick nod and turned back to X. Okay? So now the question is, who is X? Is X Terry? Is X uh, Owen? Or is X Emily? Okay? So what do you think? Can you solve this? How many of you think it's Terry? How many of you think it's, it's Emily? Owen? So you can see that it's pretty tough, but if you are, you know, if you're fluent in English, once you parse the sentence out, you will be able to answer it correctly. And people can answer it correctly with like, you know, 98, 99% accuracy, right? Because once you sort of start figuring out who's standing where, who's talking to whom, you will be able to answer the question. But this data set was constructed in such a way that if I just look at the last sentence, I will not be able to find the answer. I actually have to look at the entire paragraph to be able to figure out what the answer is, right? And that's actually pretty hard. Like, this is, this is not an easy task, right? Um, so, basically, these passages are filtered such that human can correctly answer when given the whole context, but not cannot answer given just the last sentence. So that forces us to build models that can actually aggregate information of the entire passage, right? as opposed to just doing some simple pattern recognition. And this is where you can think of you know, trying to build models that can do a little bit of reasoning right? um, or thinking, as opposed to just doing simple pattern matching. Um, so we're going to set it up as a reading comprehension task. Uh, we're just going to set it up, you know, here's the query, and then find x. And x is assuming to be, to be given in this document. Uh, and the reading comprehension approach is they perform the best on this task, on this task, right? So how do we do that? How do we find the right answer? Well, maybe we can look at some kind of uh, syntactic dependency. We can say she gave, uh, uh, you know, turn to whom, turn to x, and she gave, and then she turned, right? So we can try to find who's connected to whom, or maybe turned to x, and then turn she, uh, there's some semantic dependencies, right? And uh, uh, there is something, something that's called co-reference, uh, uh, where you can look at, you know, the three candidates, and then you can basically say, you know what? When I talk about her, I talk about Emily. When I talk about Terry, I talk about him. When I talk about Owen, that's all. And then when I say she gave me, I can do co-reference resolution. And I can say Emily gave Owen a quick nod and turned back to, and then the obvious answer is X, Terry, right? And this is how people do it. People basically can kind of situate themselves in this situation, find who's talking to whom, who is uh, 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 turning to whom, and then be able to answer the question. Okay? And here the answer is Terry. Uh, and this is, this is done via core reference, right? So how can we incorporate these architectural biases into the model? So when we look at these RNNs models, the RNN models tend to forget long-term interactions. And that's one of the big problems with RNNs in general, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use memory augmented architecture. Um, we can use off-the-shelf tools to extract these dependencies, but then we can use something that's called augmented memory augmented architecture to, to try to incorporate that into, into our model, right? So we can use these linguistic annotations to guide memory propagation in the network. So how information gets propagated in the network. Let me show you one example. 
So here's an example. May uh, got the football. She went to the kitchen. She left the ball there. Okay. Now, what I can do is I can say, well, Mary and she, that means the same thing. Right? She went, that also means the same thing. And then she went to the kitchen. Right? She, Mary went and then she left. Right? So if I can come up with these links in my model, I can now propagate information forward much faster. So I can basically say Mary and she, that's the same person, right? And so that becomes important because this is where we can use core reference. We can use a lot of semantic sort of uh, uh, um, linguistic information or linguistic prime knowledge to at least help our model to propagate information in, in these models. Right? So what we're going to do, remember how we're representing documents and queries. These are done via uh, uh, RNNs. But what we're going to do is we're going to be representing document and queries via graphs. Um, right? So instead of just having this forward backward, we're actually going to be incorporating graph representation of what links are connected to what other links. And the topological order is going to be given by the sequence. Right? So this is the sequence forward, and then there's a sequence backward. And we're going to be making the assumption that we know what these things are. We know that Mary and she means the same thing, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be designing memory as an acyclic graph encoding scheme here. So we can say whenever I look at the word uh, went, right, there is she went, but there is also, um, you know, went to the kitchen. So this information will actually impact kitchen as well. Or it can also impact went and then turn left, and then went and left will impact left as well, right? So we can kind of have these extra links in our graph to propagate information forward. And you can think of it as memories. Um, and what's interesting about this particular model is you can fold everything into the sequence of uh, RNNs and just basically do the updates of, of these recurrent models by kind of compressing everything into kind of like a more glorified uh, GRU update. Um, so here's some example of what you can do. This is for Lombardi data set. If you just use a standard, uh, you know, uh, RNN-based model, you get about 60%. If you use gated attention, you get about 65%. If you use gated attention plus this memory-guided uh, representations, you get to the 70% at least. And, uh, and again, just wanted to point out that 70% accuracy is actually pretty pretty remarkable, because these are, again, fairly hard questions to, to answer. And this is, uh, as of now, I believe it's, it's, uh, it's a state of the art uh, for this particular data set. Um, right, so um, uh, here's another example of, of a Facebook baby data set. Uh, this is sort of like a toy data set, but it also you can test a lot of things. So for example, let's say I give you this document, and then I ask you, where was the apple before the office? Now, the human, you would basically say, John picked up the apple. Then you can say, John moved to the bedroom. And then John went to the office. Right? And so now you're asking, where was apple before the office? Obviously, the answer would be bedroom. Right? If you look at that particular example, to humans, it's trivial. Right? If I ask you that question. But this is kind of an interesting question to ask. Right? Because I can't just look at this particular sentence and say, oh, John picked up the apple. Apple, matching apple, and then office, you're matching office, and then how do you how do you go to John? You have to somehow learn something about John and then connect John, the John move to the bedroom, and then you have to sort of have, to have some notion of the meaning before, like apple before the office, right? So these are not that trivial constraints to incorporate, uh, right? And it's remarkable that uh, uh, these kind of RNN-like models are able to handle that situation, right? Um, and obviously, the answer would be better. Now, you have to find the right sentences and a lot of destructive sentences here, right? And how, how do you do that? Well, if we can extract co-references, and we can say John is connected to John and is connected to John, it's the same John, right? Then what happens is that when I looked at this information, I can actually propagate it forward to this sentence. And then I have this, I can forward propagate it to this sentence. Right? So I have these extra links uh, moving uh, in, 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 this, in this particular architecture. And what's interesting for this particular data set, if you just use your standard algorithms, they don't perform that well. 
But if you actually, uh, in this case, using uh, a memory and method, linguistic representation, then you can pretty much solve the task. Right? You can, it, the, the task becomes fairly easy to solve. This is a toy data set, it's an artificial data set, but at the same time it highlights that you actually can, uh, can, can solve it. Here's another example that I wanted to just show you, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, this particular representation, I have a question. How many objects does Sandra carry? And what I'm going to do is, after every single sentence, I'm going to ask the question. So, Sarah went to the hallway, and then I'm asking the model, how many objects Sandra carry? And the model predicts one. Then I give the second sentence. Sandra grabbed the apple there. So once I give you these two sentences, the question, how many objects is Sandra carrying? The model still says one. Daniel moved to the kitchen. Sandra uh, got the milkware, and the model still predicts one. So the question is, why is it always predicting one? The reason why it does it is the model basically learns from the training corpus is that any time I ask you the question, how many objects a person carrying? One is a pretty good answer, because most of the time, a person is going to be carrying one object, right? So the model here effectively learns to ignore <laughs> the input and basically just basically gives you the answer, one object, uh, right? But if you're using these linguistic regularities and these linguistic associations, then the model does something much better, right? It basically predicts that initially zero. One sound that grabbed the apple there, it predicts one. Daniel moved to the kitchen, there is some uncertainty, so it's not perfect. And then Sandra got the meal there, then the model predicts that the Sandra is carrying two objects. Uh, right. So there are kind of ways to test the system of, of can it sort of do a little bit of reasoning uh, about these questions. Um, uh, right. So summary so far, and, and bear with me, I'm almost uh, done. Uh, um, you can basically have a better model in terms of long-term dependency, right? So, uh, and what's interesting is that if you use, if you introduce noise, if you have these linguistic regularities, but there's a lot of noise in them, then the performance drops, right? So that's one of kind of uh, 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 examples here is that if you, if you start putting noisy connections in the model, the accuracy basically decreases. Uh, and then the big question is that can we actually join train annotations and reading comprehension models? So can we actually find what the right architecture should be? and what should be connected to what. There's some work uh, uh, in, that, in that domain, but it's very difficult to figure out what, how can we train uh, those two things jointly. The other very interesting area of research is common sense, uh, which is very, very difficult task. So imagine I give you some document like this, Eurythmic, where a British music duo consistent, uh, consisting of members Annie Lexon and David Stewart. Okay. And then I ask you the question, who was the female member of the 1980 pop music duo Eurythmic? Uh, right? So if I ask you the female member, obviously the answer is going to be any. Right? It's not going to be David. The question is, how do you know that? Well, you have some common knowledge. You know that Amy is a female and David is male. Like, it's a female name versus David uh, is a male name. But there is no kind of implicit knowledge in these uh, models that can de disassociate. Because any is represented as a word, some vector in the, uh, in, in the vector space, and David is represented as some vector in the vector space, right? So unless we have some prime knowledge, it's kind of difficult to answer that question correctly. So that's, uh, uh, that's, a, big, that's a big challenge. So where can we find such a knowledge? And we need more data sets to test these kinds of which is how can you take, you know, your language representation? How can you look at some uh, uh, knowledge like co-references, entity relations, word relations, and come up with a much better representation of the textual, uh, uh, um, of sentences or the text that you're working with, right? So there's a lot of research where people are trying to figure out how we can do that. Because if we can do that in a much more reliable way, then we could build systems that can actually, you know, not just do simple retrieval, but can actually reason and be able to give us uh, complicated answers. And the last part, just very quickly, I wanted to show you that there is also a retrieval and comprehension aspect, right? So you want to build systems that can search and read for open domain questions, right? So, so far, reading comprehension assumes that the passage already contains the answer. 
right? And I give you the passage, and I just ask you the question about the passage. But for real question, question answering, we actually need to search for the passages as well, right? So, for example, you know, if I give you this particular question, 7-Eleven stores were temporarily converted into K-Week e-marts to promote the release of what movie? Right, so you have a whole bunch of corpus, maybe Wikipedia, in this case, these are Wikipedia articles. And maybe you want to retrieve a whole bunch of different uh, Wikipedia articles about something relevant to the question, right, and then be able to answer that question. So the approach that we've been looking at is, is again, sort of combining retrieval. Given the, given the question, you want to find the retrieved articles. Once you have the retrieved articles, then you want to do reading comprehension to answer questions. By, by trying to read these articles and come up with the right, uh, with the right answer. And um, there is a very nice data set, uh, was released by Facebook. Um, it's called Movie Question Answering Data Set. So the question might be of the form, Ridley Scott directed which films? And the answer is like Blade Runner, Gladiator, Alien, and so forth, right? Um, and the big challenge is, can you answer the questions by extracting knowledge from unstructured knowledge sources? So here you have 18,000 Wikipedia articles just off the web uh, about movies, right? So if I give you this question, how do you find the right Wikipedia articles? Once you find the right Wikipedia articles, can you then go read those Wikipedia articles with your reading comprehension model and then answer the question? Um, and so, you know, again, there's a retrieval and comprehension step, and it's, it's, it's actually interesting, both steps are kind of similar. Right, because you can look at the question, you can now encode the question into a fixed length vector that carries some meaning about what this question is about. You can then do a very quick attention over tokens that appear in a movie article and then come up with a score. And the score can tell you how relevant this particular Wikipedia article to the question, right? You can also use keywords. You can also use traditional retrieval approaches, information retrieval approaches to narrow down the search. Right? So maybe you're retrieving, you know, uh, a thousand articles and then you're doing a little bit more expensive retrieval by, by looking at the representation of the question and the movie. Once you've done that, then you can do the reading comprehension task to do very careful reading of, of, of the relevant uh, Wikipedia articles. So here's one example that I wanted to show you, uh, where you can also use something that's called gating. Uh, between kind of looking at the answers in the text versus looking at the answers of your predefined uh, possible answers, right? So this is one example I wanted to show you. Uh, you know, let's say there is some Wikipedia article, and then the question is, what language is Koi Mil Gaia in? Okay? And then this definition basically says, Mil Goy Gaia in 2003, the Bollywood science fiction film, and so forth, right? Now, the interesting thing here is that the model uses the vocabulary to answer the correct answer because nowhere in this passage you have the right answer which is Hindi, right? Um, but if you just look at the overall vocabulary you can find the right sort of R structure and the way you do it is the model basically focuses on Bollywood and once it has a focus on Bollywood that it can connect, make a connection to Hindi because Bollywood movies are in Hindi, not in English. So the model kind of finds correctly that the answer should be him. So this is gets to kind of, you know, combining attention and expanding uh, a little bit of your reading comprehension task. Uh, but again, it's one of those things where you can kind of find the correct features from the text and be able to answer the, uh, the, 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 uh, the questions correctly, which is pretty interesting and also very exciting. There are also a couple of other ways, uh, uh, examples that I wanted to show you. Um, there is a whole area of something that's called variational thing called generative models where you can basically construct generative models for generating textual data, right? So you can sample some attributes of the text and be able to generate something about the textual representation. Once you have that, you can potentially start thinking about generative models of questions. Like given a passage, can you generate the question and the answer um, and such? So you can now build models that can actually come up with interesting questions about the passages, right, themselves. Here's one example where, you know, you can basically do interesting things. Like, for example, you can generate the sentence by saying the movie was awful and boring. But if you uh, uh, fix a latent, a latent space a little differently, you can then generate uh, uh, this movie was funny and touching. 
right? So by controlling the latent, the semantic space, you can generate kind of uh, uh, different sentences. So there is a very big area of research of trying to uh, find or, or do sort of linguistic transformation. For example, I can give you a, a sentence, uh, a, a, you know, and, and maybe I want to make this sentence polite, right? So somebody gives you a sentence and maybe you want to convert the sentence to a more polite sentence, right? So try to come up with a representation of style, right? And I can, if I can change the style, I can generate the same sentences in multiple styles. Um, and that's a big area of research because in many languages, you know, maybe you want to have a chatbot and depending on the style, you can change the style of the way the chatbot is operating, right? You can also kind of like, you know, varying uh, the unstructured code and, and so, for example, you can go uh, from negative uh, uh, to positive, right? The acting was also kind of hit and miss or the acting was impeccable. Um, and again, this is now comes to the area of actually being able to generate the natural language or the natural text uh, uh, and be able to control the features of the generated text, right? And that can potentially help you, again, maybe rephrase the questions or can not just provide you a simple answer, like the answer is, 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 is uh, Tom Cruise, but actually generate a whole sentence in a naturalistic way, then you can use these kinds of uh, these kinds of representations. So thank you. I'll stop here. I think I'm running out of time, and um, maybe if you guys have any questions, I can I can answer them. Okay. Thank you for the talk. And, yeah, we will have some questions now. Sure. Um, uh, do, you guys, uh, do you guys see me, or or should I um, unshare the screen? I'm not sure if you can we see do, me. We do. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Um, so, so thank you, that was quite comprehensive one lecture. Um, I'm having a bunch of questions. Uh, first of all, um, concerning the standard uh, attention uh, reader model uh, that you've presented us uh, mm, at the beginning uh, of the lecture, uh, the question is, um, as we see, uh, usually we do have uh, our word correlates with uh, a few uh, surrounding words uh, in the uh, documents. And uh, because of this, uh, before applying attention, we need to process it with Jerry uh, or some other. But the question is uh, if we actually need um, only a short window or, I don't know, a window of 10 words surrounding the words, this uh, exact word, then uh, why do we actually use GRU? Because uh, GRU are not uh, parallelizable, for example. And if I need, uh, why do I have to wait for the previous 10 words to uh, compute uh, if I can, can already uh, um, do some stuff with these current tools? Yeah. Are there any ways? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's an uh, 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 excellent question. So, uh, in the last couple of years, what people are now doing is instead of using RNNs, people are now also trying to use convolutional models. So, what you can think about the convolutional models is that you look at the 10 words and you're just processing these 10 words. So you're kind of like using sliding window. Yeah, I, I know about the convolutional models. Yeah, right. So that's another way of doing it, mm -hmm. which works well and it's parallelizable. So you can speed things up substantially. That's the main reason why people use these convolutional models. But in terms of the accuracy, uh, so far, just empirically, it seems like the these GRUs or LSTMs, so these recurrent networks, they tend to perform better. So it's just the question of uh, accuracy for now. It's just for now, it's a question of accuracy. But if you are interested in speeding up, then definitely there are multiple ways of speeding things up. Uh, like a convolutional is one way. Or maybe you can construct some kind of parallelized, try to parallelize uh, an RNN where you now, you yeah, kind of like simple, just. Simple yeah, that's right. Again. So there are ways of trying to parallelize it. And, and again, it's just that right now, and then um, the other thing that you should think about is that once you start using more sort of uh, these linguistic knowledge, so connecting, you know, something that happened two sentences ago, you want to connect it to the current sentence, mm -hmm. right? You have this skip connection, skip link, 
then you have to take this into account, right? Because the hidden state is like a summary, some summary of the context, and it can impact some context two sentences from now, or three sentences from now, uh, right? So this is something that's, you know, and again, maybe you can construct it using convolutions as well. And so, yeah, basically right now it's a question of, of accuracy. If you want to speed it up, that's a very good question. Uh, because these models are expensive, right? They are very accurate, but they're also very expensive. I play with them. Um, so my second question is uh, about the uh, aggregating a step in this uh, attention regions. Uh, so you, you, you showed us uh, quite a lot of uh, ways to quite a lot of uh, models. Uh, uh, have you, well, um, so my question is, uh, you have uh, this uh, model with uh, uh, annotation, yeah, that do this, uh, the annotation representations mm -hmm. uh, to perform better with data attention yes, as well. And uh, have you tried to play with uh, aggregating uh, mechanism? Because I've just recently um, read a paper for example attention over attention where you do have some different uh, a different aggregating result and in itself uh, gives us a score of about 70 uh, accuracy without having multiple uh, attention stacks uh, on top of uh, yeah yeah definitely I think that right now uh, we haven't played a lot with uh, uh, with attention over attention but I know that attention over attention is, is you know and then is a self attention so right now, there is a whole exploration of different aggregation functions, I agree. And in many cases, some of them can give better results than others. Mm -hmm. So we are still at the exploration stage. And people, you know, so here we've used a very simple aggregation function, which is a pointer sum network, which is, you know, very sort of, uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very trivial uh, aggregation function. Um, but at the same time, yeah, the attention of attention and, and self-attention is something that's just coming out in the last year where people are exploring different ways of, of doing attention. So there is no right now kind of a jury on what's the best, uh, let me just go, uh, go back, what's the best sort of, um, you know, so this is, this is sort of what's the best uh, structure right now. All right. Right, so, so for example, this is just a very simple attention, a point of some attention, right, it's just aggregating all the tokens, but if you can come up with a self-attention or attention of attention, so everything is connected to everything, maybe you don't need multiple passes. Um, maybe you do. Uh, so it's still kind of early stages of research. People are still trying to figure out what is the best representation, right, like paraphrasing and such, What's the best way to do alignment? That's the multiplicative gating that I've talked about. And what's the best way to do aggregation? Okay. So there is a lot of research kind of trying to tackle three problems at the same time, basically. Right? Uh, okay, and the last question is uh, about the information retrieval. Um, you also, well, I saw a model, but uh, the previous lecture um, told us, uh, and it was very inspiring, by the way, that uh, we, we don't, don't um, actually have a raw uh, data overall. We uh, can use, for example, Google to extract some of the information uh, in order to answer uh, our questions. Are there any steps uh, on this way? Maybe yes. some paper side, you know. Yeah, so maybe I'm not that much familiar with the information uh, extraction community, but, but yes. If I look at the overall information extraction, maybe you can come up, you know, if, you, if, if you're trying to do retrieval, maybe you can go through Google and already sort of come up with some candidate answers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true, and that's in, in a lot of times, you know, Google or other sort of tech giants, they have a lot of predefined fixed features and hand engineering features that, that work fairly well. Um, what we're trying to do is we're basically trying to go in a completely different route and try to come up with models that can potentially learn the right representation in the end-to-end -end fashion, right? So typically what we have for our reading comprehension, uh, for our model, for movie question answering, what we actually do is because there is 18,000 Wikipedia articles, we can't really read every single Wikipedia article. So what we do is we do make use of information retrieval models, like looking at the 
keys and, and doing something in inverted indices, uh, which is the standard kind of uh, model. Maybe you can use something from, from Google with additional features to come up with a candidate set of about 20 articles. Right? Once we have these 20 articles, then we employ a, you know, an expensive reading comprehension model. Mm -hmm. Right, to sort of read all, all of them. And then there is something in between where you can say, look, I can use information that you don't matter, like key values and matching, maybe to retrieve a thousand articles. And then I can use uh, the, the retrieval model, it's a little bit more expensive, that encodes the, qu the, the query, the semantic meaning of the query, and semantic meaning of the document tries to match the two. Right. I think that in many cases it comes down to when we view these models from machine learning perspective, we want to be able to we want to be able to do retrieval based on semantic meaning of the question versus the document, right? Are they semantically the same? Um, and whereas the retrieval communities, they typically rely a little bit more on matching, like actual words occurring in a document and the query, right? So both, has, both have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, in the machine learning community, we, we are kind of trying to come up with models where we can do everything in end-to-end -end fashion, you know, without relying too much on engineered features. In the tribal community, it's a little bit different. So sometimes we don't talk to each other. <laughs> uh, but um, on, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I believe there's going to be some kind of hybrid approach. You need some hand engineering features to really come up with some representations. And maybe you can use Google or other search engines to give you a pre-filtered list. Uh, but at the same time, then you rely on Google, right? If Google is wrong, then you're wrong. Uh, so, yeah. All right. And uh, one more question <laughs> about uh, um, linguistic this uh, alignment. So how do they call, do they call them? Linguistics, uh, uh, um, syntax. Or, uh, yeah, for reference, you know, dependency yes, parsing. Yes, yeah. Yes. Huh? Uh, how no, no, I mean uh, you you're, you're using um, some Stanford uh, MLP, yes that's right uh, yes, yes. Uh, what, what is this actually do, do you train uh, some, some more model uh, machine or is it uh, some information that is uh, done by people or some yeah yeah that's a good question so in our case the results that I've shown right now we're using Stanford NLP parsers so we rely on another model. Mm -hmm. to give us for references. So a different model right now defines the architecture for our reading comprehension. And models. So this model is already pre-trained. So. This model is already pre-trained, so it's just off the shelf. It's an off the shelf model that says, I think these for references exist. Okay. So we just embed it into our model. Now, as I mentioned in, in one of the points is that I think that a more interesting research direction would be to train both models simultaneously. So you're training the model that predicts dependency parses as well as in such a way that improves your um, your 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 uh, you know answering accuracy, and that's a model a lot of my students is working on precisely a model like this because the state of the art co-reference models right now are essentially based on neural networks. They're essentially based on recurrent neural networks plus a few twists, uh, uh, bells and whistles. So what you can do is you can combine you know, the co-reference model, because it's a model, it's a neural network-like model, plus the reading comprehension model, if you stitch two of them together mm -hmm. and back rope through both of them, the hope is that the model will be able to learn what co-references it should be using, or what information should be propagating, what links it should be predicting, with the goal of actually just correctly predicting the answer. So we're working on this model right now, there's been a few papers out of Microsoft, I think, had a paper, um, and then if someone else has like, you know, trying to basically work in that space, it's pretty difficult. Um, because there's a lot of noise and, you know, if you kind of introduce noise and you don't use correct core references, then it can actually degrade the model performance. Because you're giving it wrong knowledge, and you're giving it incorrect information. So, but that's a very interesting area of research. Just in the last year, people are, are trying to look into that. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. We'll have some more questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is about uh, transfer learning in NLP. So, 
Uh, some of these neural architectures that you described and many others perform pretty well on large-scale question answering data sets like Stanford QA. Yeah. And uh, my question is, are there any attempts to use the pre-trained architectures on those large data sets as feature extractors for other data when we don't have <coughs> as many examples? Yeah, that's a very good. That's a very good question. I think that there is some work, very little work, in a sort of domain where, you know, can I pre-train a model on one domain and then basically be able to bootstrap its performance on the other domain very quickly? So, um, there are sort of people have shown some successful results, but not like amazingly successful. One big success uh, in the past has been uh, um, word embeddings, mm -hmm. right? So pretty much every single system right now, question answering, you know, Stanford extractive QA uh, is, is using word to vec embeddings or glove embeddings, which is something that's trained on a large corpus of Wikipedia articles or internet uh, and, and basically using that as, as, a, as a first pre-trained features. There's been some work also where you basically, if you can um, uh, take, for example, a simple data set of like CNN news stories, or you, where you construct these closed style questions, uh, the ones that I've shown are fairly simple ones. What the observation is that if you, if you train the models in that, on that domain, they take the representations, take the features, and then apply them to the Stanford QA data set, with just you know 10% of labeled examples, you can achieve very good accuracy, right? Is there a paper but then, that you can refer? To? Uh, is what? there a paper that you can refer to? Uh, unfortunately, there is not. Ah, uh, yeah, there might be a paper. Uh, I don't know. Uh, one of my students is doing that right now, and I think that they just submitted it to uh, what is it, a NACL or one of the. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's not out yet. Okay. Um, but. And so they, they, he was able to get some kind of improvement if you have 10% of Stanford QA. But then, if I, you know, if I use 100% of 100,000 questions, then, you know, this train stuff doesn't really help. Yeah, so that's the, in the other direction, right? So you uh, pre-train on uh, CNN and then try to apply on Stanford. Did I get it correctly? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. yeah uh, I thought that the opposite would be... Uh, more interesting, right? Because yeah, you can do the opposite. You can train on Stanford QA yeah, and like apply it to yeah. some uh, CNN, right? So I don't think people have done a very good study okay. of what happens and what the performances are because in many cases, some of these data sets have very specific bias. Like CNN is very news driven. Mm -hmm. Stanford is, you know, a lot of it is like scientific terms. Mm -hmm. So there might be, you know, some mismatch across domains. Um, but maybe what you could do is you could basically take a whole bunch of different data sets, put them together, train one big gigantic question answering system, like a reading comprehension system, and then basically say, including the Stanford and such, and then take that representation and say, now I'm going to apply it in you know, some other domain. How well can I do with few examples? I think that you will find out that you can do much better. So there is going to be transfer. Uh, but the effect of the transfer will kind of diminish as you collect more and more domain-specific yeah. data, yes. as is usually the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, guys, we still have some time for questions. Uh, yeah. Please. Uh, hello, this is uh, Andre from OneLevel. Uh, so, one, one question about um, this uh, multiplicative, multiplicative attention model that you were presenting before. Uh, so, there's, there's a work in a related problem, you know, uh, natural language inference, you might have heard about it, uh, mm -hmm. by Ankur Parikh and others, mm -hmm. which is kind of similar to this model with a few differences. So, they don't have the RNN, there's no multiple mm -hmm. attention and so on. But they, they also consider, uh, you know, um, a representation of the, of the query, so to speak, as a weighted, right. uh, weighted by attention. But the difference is that instead of doing the multi element-wise multiplication, they do a concatenation of the two yes. representations. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering 
what are we really getting here with these element-wise multiplications? Because these sort of multiplications are useful if you know you are multiplying multi multiplying gates, for example. Mm -hmm. Is this what we're trying to capture with this model? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, so you know, people have tried before instead of using this multiplicative gate. So let me just go up again. Uh, instead of using this multiplicative gating, what you can do is you can basically just do concatenation, uh, right? And so people have done that. What we've discovered, and I don't have a very good or very consistent answer why, but the multiplicative gating helps a lot empirically. And we believe it might have to do something with optimization, or it might have to do something that, you know, basically um, sometimes, you know, this particular gating can kill the representation of the documents, right? So if you can kind of like, if, if these are close to zero, and if these are very large, then potentially this multiplicative gating can basically make this term be irrelevant, right? Um, so this is something that we sometimes see that for some words that don't really carry much meaning, this multiplicative gating just basically kills it. And so what goes to the next layer is basically talking with like some almost almost zero as an input. So it doesn't carry any information to the next layer. Um, there is another paper that we had, uh, which is called multiplicative integration with recurrent neural network, which is a more, more general multiplicative mechanism where you take the hidden state, you take the input representation, and you use element-wise multiplication. And we found that, again, this particular mechanism allows us to build much better models. And again, we believe that it it's, it's somehow has to do with the optimization. The reason why is because when we backprop, when we take derivatives with respect to Q, this D can have, an, have a direct impact on, on, on the gradients. So when we take derivative with respect to D, Q can have a direct impact on these things. Whereas if you use the concatenation, it doesn't. Right? It only does it through maybe some high layer uh, RNN. So there's a very direct link. Like when you, have, when you multiply two numbers, and I take derivative with respect to one, the second one will modulate the gradient. Right. So, and again, these are just uh, guesses for us. Um, but on a whole bunch of problems, we do find that this particular element-wise gating helps a lot. And the same thing we've done it for character and word-like gating. Um, it's just that, uh, yeah. Again, I think that in many cases it can shut down some of the words. So whenever they go up to the next layer, they basically only propagating zeros, no information. So it can kill. Uh, uh, some of the words that don't really carry much uh, information for to, to answer the question. And then the second one is optimization. But these are just guesses. No one has done kind of like a very clear theory of why this multiplicative gating would result in better optimization or easier optimization. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. So I just have another question, which is for the, the model where you use linguistic knowledge, dependency yeah. parseries and preference. Uh, so you suggested in, someone asked a similar question before. Uh, so you were uh, um, uh, suggesting multitask learning or something like that as work that you are already doing. Uh, so uh, how about trying to you know, instead of perform, trying to perform well on the NLP tasks, just using them to guide uh, the information that you want to propagate, uh, you know, through your uh, recurrent network. Because, you know, all these networks, GRUs, and so on, they all have these uh, input and forget gates and so on. And this is essentially what you're trying to capture, right? So you want to kind of, you have some supervision about what kind of information you want to let uh, through these gates. Uh, is, is this something that, that you are thinking about? or? So, yeah, so, 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 but the way, the way that I think about it is that, you know, if you look, for example, one particular example of co-reference, Right? Co-reference basically means that these two words mean the same thing. They refer to the same person, for example. Mm -hmm. Right? And when we introduce an extra link, think of it as a skip connection. Right? What, what that means is that basically any time information from this point can kind of like jump to the point over here. Right? So it's like a residual network. It's, it's kind of like, how do I make sure that my information skips through some part of the text and in, impacts some representation, you know, that could be two or three sentences from now. If I look at forget gates, 
right? Typically with RNNs, what forget gates can do, what the gating mechanisms in RNN can do, they can shut down the information. So they can basically say, here's the information flow, and now I sign a new paragraph. And the new paragraph has nothing to do with the old paragraph. So, so the forget gate can shut it down. But the problem with RNNs in general is that it's very hard to carry information forward for long periods of time. Right. And so this is where these skip connections and these linguistic regularities can help us. Right. Because you're fixing it into the memory and then just basically just impacting something in the future. But you can still try to learn the skip connections from that data without, yes, yes, we without are. caring we about are. the reference or dependency. That's right. right. So we're actually learning the weights on these skip connections. Okay. So when I was d discussing the model, it's actually learning what these weights should be and whether it should ignore some of them. Right. The question that I was also interested in is that, you know, can we actually build the model that jointly sort of predicts the connections and then uses the reading comprehension task to answer the question. And then when you backpropagate through the model, it's kind of like with the self-attention, it can learn what connections should exist and what connections shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, linguistic uh, a core reference probably makes sense because we believe linguistically it makes sense, but maybe the model, you know, needs to connect some other tokens in order to be able to answer the question. These might not necessarily be core reference, could be something else, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but again, it's very difficult to construct these models. So if you look at some recent literature of, of uh, attention is all you need, yeah. think of it as just basically everything is connected to everything. So, and then you're kind of like doing soft thing, trying to figure out what should survive. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously it's very expensive. For machine translation, it's simple. It's easy, right? Because it's sentence to sentence. But if you have this huge paragraph, then, you know, you're looking at this particular word, it's, it's you know, you can't really like have attention over like everything in the past. So it becomes very computationally extensive. So the question is, can you build models that are smart about what existing connections should exist? So you can just push information forward and skip, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of, and that's an open, open research question right now. Okay, thank you. So are there any more questions from the audience? Uh, okay, then I, I, will, I will ask a question myself. Uh, uh, there, there is a traditional, traditional question which we always ask to all our speakers. Uh, as you might know, our lab here in MIPT is doing research on dialogue systems, both goal-oriented and chatbots. And since you come from the text comprehension side, uh, could you probably um, give us an advice what, uh, which techniques and algorithms from text comprehension would be useful in uh, dialogue systems? What should we uh, have a yeah. uh, close look to? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I, I don't know what the right answer is. I think that, you know, I have a student working on dialogue systems right now, and what we're finding is that one of the biggest problems is, is having a good data set and being able to evaluate your models. I think that, you know, right now, a lot of more successful dialogue-based systems are kind of hand-tuned systems, right? It's like based on rules and such. So the question is, can you build something better than this? Is, 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 uh, is uh, you know, I think that if you look at these models, if you look at RNNs, if you're looking at attention, um, you're looking at sequence-to-sequence models, those are probably the best ones to look at. You know, sequence to sequence is probably the simplest one for the dialogue based system, right? It's just like an RNN that reads your question and then spits out the answer and stuff like that. So, if you look at, for example, I don't know if you know Yandex, I have some friends working at Yandex and they had like a chat bot right now. And essentially, it's a sequence to sequence model with attention, right? So, it's pretty much similar models to what I'm describing here. Um, so, those are the models to kind of look at. There is also some work on using reinforcement learning, right? If you actually want to maintain a dialogue-based systems and the enforcement learning basically says, well, if I answer it this way, what the user, what would, you know, the next question user would provide, right? And there is some kind of work in uh, the enforcement learning because uh, your goal might be to maintain a conversation for 10 minutes or something like that. Uh, but it's still, it's a very kind of obscure area right now from, from machine learning and deep learning. Obviously, it's a very well-defined area for folks who are doing dialogue-based systems based on rules and sort of trying to 
you know, come up with very specific uh, uh, features and so forth. The question is, can you build a dialogue-based system purely in a machine-driven approach where you're learning everything? Um, probably the best ones to look at is, again, sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, design and based models, and, and with, with attention. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so we, we now have, have probably time, time for one last question, question if there are any. Okay, okay, I think I think there are no, no questions left, so let us just thank the speaker again. Yeah.